she was last seen walking across the gymnasium to use the bathroom and then never seen again. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Deanie Peters. If you were discretion is advised. Deanie Peters was born on September 24th, 1966, and she lived with her parents and her little brother in California. But once her parents, Mary and Dwayne, they divorced, Mary would take the kids and move to Michigan with Mary's new boyfriend, who later would become her husband. Deanie's biological father stayed in California. He would go on to remarry as well. Dini, who was 14 years old at the time of this case, she had kind of a, of a rough time at, at first adapting to this new life in Michigan. Um, she was, you know, getting along with, with certain kids and just having to meet new people, make new friends. But eventually it all kind of came together for her. She was at this time an eighth grade student at Forest Hill Central Middle School, and she actually had aspirations to one day become a model. It was February 5th, 1981. Her little brother, who was like six or seven years old at this time, was competing in a wrestling match at the middle school that Deanie actually attended. And so this is around 5 p.m. Deanie and her mom go to the school to watch the, the brother do, you know, wrestling. When it was all said and done, as everyone was getting ready to leave, Deanie told her mom, hey, I need to go use the bathroom. Is that okay? The mom says yes. And then her mom sees Deanie walk across the gymnasium and into the hallway where the bathrooms were. And then Deanie never came out. Deanie was never seen ever again. Her mom sat outside the gymnasium waiting and waiting for her and wondering what the heck has taken so long. Why, you know, where the heck, where is Deanie? And because she goes back into school, she starts looking around. She's looking around outside the school. Nowhere. She can't find her. She's 14 years old. I mean, it's where could she have possibly gone? Deanie was not having any issues at home with her parents. She had not been one of those kids who's like, oh, I'm going to run away because I'm so angry. Uh, she got along with her brother. She was doing well in school. Everything was going good for her. She was a happy go lucky kid who never once showed any signs of possibly running away or anything along those lines. And so once her mom and her stepdad reported her missing, the police kind of looked into the family life to see if maybe this could have been a runaway, but they felt that there's just no way this was a runaway because if she was running away, she brought nothing with her. All of her belongings, literally all of her clothes, her makeup bag, which apparently she would never go anywhere too far without. She always loved putting on her makeup. Uh, she also had cash in, in her wallet in her bedroom. None of that was with her. And so the police really felt that this was not a runaway. This was something happened. I, she's missing. This is foul play. Something. They would start conducting searches. They searched the entirety of the school. They searched outside of the school. They searched all of the wooded areas. They went through all the ponds in that area and they looked top to bottom through the ponds. They had sometimes had dug up uh, some area of, uh, of a swamp. They have other parts where they've gotten like these random tips like, oh, I think she might, might be buried here or I think she might be there. And none of those digs or any of those searches ever came up with anything. Like nothing of her has ever, ever been found. Not her body, not clothing, nothing. No trace. Her parents would go on the news pleading for whoever may have done something to their daughter, you know, please give her back to us, hopefully alive. But if not, please allow us to lay her to rest if that's the case. But there was no response to those pleads on the news either. It got to a point where the family had a psychic come in because, I mean, why not? And the psychic would say, like, I, you know, I have these senses that she's here or they, they look over here. But even those, you know, the psychics, they never really produced any actual, like, valid proof or evidence of where Dini was or what happened to her. In their initial investigation, there was a custodian at the middle school who was working there the night of the wrestling match. 
His name was Arthur Diaz, and I, I guess they considered him a suspect just simply because he was an adult male who was there kind of on his own alone in the building. And Dini would have been possibly have crossed paths with this guy as she was potentially going to the bathroom. They looked into him, they dug up his past, and they couldn't really find anything. And they also searched, you know, his area of the school where he, he would usually be, especially the school's furnace. They thought, well, maybe he killed her and burned her. But they determined that the furnace was not going to be hot enough to, like, really burn a human body. They also found no evidence or traces of anyone being in that furnace. And he was eventually ruled out as being a suspect. It was really mainly just speculation. They didn't really have any actual grounds to say, oh, he's the guy. It was really more just uh, he was there when it happened. So he did say that he noticed that there were three teenage boys who were roaming around the halls around the same time that Deanie would have gone missing. And I don't know if they actually identified which three boys those were. But he did say that he noticed one of the boys kind of like pounding on a door, a locked door, but they, he, doesn't really, he didn't really know what they were doing or who they were trying to get to. They interviewed people who were at the school that night and nobody can actually say for certain if they even saw Deanie going to the bathroom. There was no proof she ever even got to the bathroom. No witnesses, nothing. And so you kind of have this possibility of, well, did Deanie say she was going to the bathroom, but in reality, she was going to do something else. There were rumors that maybe she went to go sneak a cigarette in, you know, she didn't want her mom to know, or maybe she was sneaky and, and meeting someone, maybe a boy, something like that, that, sh that no one really knew about. But again, that's just speculation. They don't really know for sure. They also learned through interviewing kids at the school that a few days before the disappearance, Dini had gotten into some kind of altercation with a couple other girls at school her age. They were fighting over a boy, allegedly, and one of these girls was allegedly, again, allegedly, I can't say for sure, heard saying, you know, stay away from this boy or else kind of thing. Now, I do know that police looked into these supposed girls, and I think even one of them eventually came out publicly and, and talked about this, but... They, they had no evidence that these girls had anything to do with what happened to her. The girls denied having anything to do with whatever happened to Dini, And they just, there was nothing the police could do about it. There was a, another teenager there, a 17-year-old student at the time named Bruce Bunch, who allegedly knew one of these girls that Dini had gotten into that altercation with. So the story goes that... Deanie, at some point, was walking out of the school, and it was snowing uh, at this time of the year, and he, Bruce, was driving his car and saw Deanie and realized, oh, that's the girl that was was fighting with this other girl that I know. And so the, the story became that Bruce hit Deanie or tried to swerve towards her just to scare her, but slid on the ice and accidentally actually ran her over and then realized he killed her, and then he took her body, threw it in some bushes, and then later came back to dispose of her somewhere else and buried her. The reason why Bruce Bunch came up on their radar was he had allegedly told people about dreams he had about accidentally killing Dini, but he always said they were just dreams, not that he was actually confessing. But then over the years, as time goes by, he would become an alcoholic, he would start drinking a lot, and reportedly he told 20 to 30 different people in these states of being drunk that he was the one to have killed that girl from Forest Hills Middle School. He never actually said her name to them, just that girl. During one of these alleged confessions while he was drunk, he had kind of said like where he put her. Police would go to those locations and they would dig up those areas, but they never found her. They never found anything. Then uh, some distant relatives of Bruce would say to police, so yeah, I overheard that he had claimed about killing her and I, he might, she might be buried underneath this building somewhere. And so they dig there, they look there, but again, nothing. Now, they never had any evidence or proof that Bruce Bunch did anything to Deanie. I, I don't know for sure if they did, but I have to imagine they looked at his car at that time to see if there was any kind of damage to it. But I don't know for sure. 
but they've they never arrested him they never publicly really said he is definitely the guy they have sort of announced him as a person of interest over the years and the decades but never had any evidence to actually indict or charge him with anything related to this case. In 2008, Bruce Bunch dies of a heart attack. And if, if he was responsible for what happened to Dini, that secret went to his grave with him. But again, I want to reiterate, there was no actual proof that he did this. He only ever confessed while he was drunk. And sometimes, yeah, I mean, alcohol can work kind of like a truth serum at times. Sometimes people will spill truthful information, but sometimes people, when they get drunk, they will over embellish certain stories or, you know, they'll twist things to make it them sound cooler or different, or it's not really a, a, a truly a sign of actual guilt. I mean, yeah, sure, it's suspicious. It's strange that he would say these things, but you need actual proof of a, him committing a crime. Back in July of 1991, uh, Dini's mom would get Dini declared legally dead. Despite that, they have continued searching for her. They have continued to get leads and tips. And every time they get a tip or a lead, they dig up a certain spot or they look into a swamp or they look in this certain body of water and they just get all sorts of different tips. But all of them, kind of like always in this particular case, all of them lead to nothing. They would have, like in 1993, they had a new investigative team working on this case, but they got nowhere with it. And then it was reopened again sometime around 2008 as by a cold case team. And they interviewed and re-interviewed people that were at the school that night, those who are still around. They've combed through the very little evidence that they have. I mean, there is no physical evidence to actually look through because they never they never found her or her, her any or anything. And so there really was never much to work with. I mean, really all they can have and they can really look into is people. Like we can only go and interview this person or that person to see what they know. They believe that there is people in this community, that community, who knew exactly what happened to Dini that day and this will not say anything. They will not talk to police because they don't want to implicate themselves. They don't want to get in trouble with a person who may have done it. Maybe they are afraid of that person, but police do believe without a shadow of a doubt that there are people currently living in that area who definitely know what happened to her. And they just need someone, just one of those people to come forward. In the summer of 2021, police announce we have arrested a suspect out of nowhere, a man named James Douglas Frisbee. He would have been about 21 years old back in 1981, and he was living in that general area, which is in like the Ada, Michigan kind of area. When they initially arrested him, they were not really, they didn't really say exactly what they arrested him for, but it would later come out that he was actually arrested in relation to the Dini Peters case. Uh, he was arrested and charged with Perjury. He was working at this sign making shop and he was arrested just outside of his shop. And so according to the court documents, he is accused of lying and falsifying information with regards to this investigation. That he had made false statements to police. And part of these court documents also state that there were other witnesses that this guy, this Frisbee guy, had talked to and said, hey, when police interview you, do not bring your cell phone with you. He instructed people to not take their cell phone to the police station when they were interviewed about this case. And the charges also state that he has willfully and intentionally impeded the investigation and tampered with wet witnesses. I guess they discovered that this guy claimed or they found out somehow that this man had knowledge of a cold case. He said a cold case from back in the 80s. And then police would later state that the information about this cold case was relating to the homicide of Deanie Peters. But it's, it's important to note that he has not been charged with connection to her disappearance in terms of having done it himself or to her murder. Uh, they've even said, I've even watched one interview, one interview where the police say they don't really think he actually had involvement in the murder. He had more involvement in the after the fact, like he may know who did it, 
but is trying to hide that information and prevent people from talking about who did it. It does not look like he had any connection to Bruce Bunch either. Like they were a few years uh, apart age-wise and according to people in the area, they did not run in the same circle. They did not know each other. Bruce Bunch's family does not even know who this Frisbee guy is. They never seen or heard of him before. They just, there. so there is no connection between the two of them. And Bruce Bunch's family is now hoping that one, now that this guy is here, even though Bruce Bunch is dead, like maybe they can finally uh, clear him as a suspect in this case. Allegedly, a woman would come forward sometime around all this now happening about a story she heard while she was, I guess, canoeing in this lake around 1999 or so. Apparently a man who was from Lowell that this man had said that he and two other people had hit Deanie with their car and killed her, put uh, her body in the trunk of this car, and then later buried her body somewhere along the river. The man in question was not Bruce Bunch, but a man named Joseph Falstrom, who I guess was interviewed by police on a couple different occasions sometime in the early 90s about this case. So they've interviewed him a few times. They always had Bruce Bunch in the back of their minds. They've interviewed him several times. Now they have this Frisbee guy who has some sort of connection to this. He may be withholding information about who did it. They have suspects and persons of interest. But again, when we're doing a criminal investigation here, especially in a case without a, a body, you need some very strong evidence to arrest someone and people being drunk on a river somewhere and saying some drunken story about how they did this and did that while it is definitely very concerning and very like okay this might be the person who did it it also doesn't mean that that's the truth if that makes sense at all because when you're going to arrest someone and charge someone for potentially murdering a young girl you 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 have to have the evidence you have to have proof because you have to be able to take this to a courtroom and present it in front of a jury and say, here is the evidence that we know that this person, without a shadow of a doubt, killed her and disposed of her here. And the biggest thing they need is her body. That's the thing they need. They need to know where she is. But as of today, me filming this in August of 2024, they don't have her body. They don't have any places to look anymore they've they've done that already they have searched places and dug up places but they still need the public's help um to find her which can then to properly arresting the person who actually did this to her and why they did it well who knows how did it happen in such a short window of time again who knows there is currently, I think, around twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars in reward money being offered for any information that helps lead to finding her body and also to prosecuting successfully the person who did this to her. It sounds like the situation with Mr. Frisbee is still ongoing, so I don't know what the outcome is to that right now. But somebody somewhere out there knows the truth. And it sounds like in this case, so many people have blabbed while drunk that one of them may have been telling the truth, but they might need other people to come forward to state something else they might know. There might be someone out there who has direct knowledge, confirmed direct knowledge of one of these people having committed the crime. And these people may be afraid to come forward. Well, you can report your information anonymously. You do not have to say who you are. All you have to say is what you know that helps them find the answers to this case. If you know something, but were not directly involved in the murder or the hiding of the body, there's a chance you won't be prosecuted if you have information. But if you were involved in it, um, you'll probably be prosecuted for it, obviously. But if you have any information about the disappearance of Deanie Peters in 1981, Please call 616-774-2345 or 616-632-6123 if you have anything that can help this family get answers and get Dini home to lay her to rest. Please do so. Please provide that information. Please help Dini Peters and her family get the justice they all rightfully deserve.
But that is it for this case, True Crime, Aruni, Dooney, Dingleberry, Dongs. I hope you found it interesting. As usual, please, uh, if you're new here, hello, my name is Mike. I tell multiple true crime stories here uh, every single week on YouTube. So please subscribe if you are into that kind of thing. Give the video a like so more people can see the video. Uh, the more people that see it, you never know, the right one person might see this that can help actually solve this case. And I also tell short form true crime stories over on a couple different TikTok pages. The links to those are in the link tree in the description of this video below. The links to my TikToks also will come up here at some point in the beginning at the end in this corner. So click that if you want to. And then also in the link tree below, you'll find my merch store. We have like t-shirts and hoodies and like a wine glass and stuff like that. Uh, we do ship all over the entire planet. So feel free to check through that if you like. And then lastly, if there's a case you want me to cover, just send me a really quick email. My email is listed below. All you have to do is send me the name of the case, where it happened, when it happened. I'll add that to the list. The list is over 6,300 names long. And I pick the cases I cover each time at random. So I cannot promise you when I'll cover that case, but I will get to it eventually. I promise at some point. So yeah. And then yeah, that's it for this video. Drew Crime Aroonies. Nope. Let's end with a joke. I want to preface this by saying that I am a natural blonde, so this applies to me. <clears throat> a blonde walks into a bar. She never saw it coming. She, she never saw it coming? Into the... Anyway, okay. <laughs> anyway, bye. <laughs>